thanks for watching. Uh, real quick, never pay again membership as well as the uh, Merkel Black catalog is ending soon. Make sure you guys take advantage of that this weekend. It will be gone by Monday. Uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who supported on that. Also, remember Frequency and Vibration Part 3 is out as well as the guide of 2025. A lot of questions I got answered in those videos, so make sure you guys take advantage. Also, again, flash drops going out. Uh, people who uh, asked about the Never Pay Again membership on Market by Academy, we're updating the site right now, so if you see a little confusion on the site, it's because it's being upgraded, added some new stuff, more courses, and just some new things. It's going to be cool you guys will see in a second. But uh, yeah, upgrading the site. Uh, when we get to the site, uh, remember, Never Pay Again members, make sure you guys go to the Never Pay Again membership section. In that section, you can go to the video catalog or the video section and you can find all of the DVDs there. All the digital downloads are there. Uh, you can click on it and it'll take you over to, um, you can see those videos. So I keep in that site only the last, uh, I think 12 or 15 videos that release, I keep on that channel. That way it keeps bandwidth down. I don't have to uh, you know, put so much space on the site. So you can see those last 15 will be right there. The newest video, of course, will be up top. And we're going to start putting that up there, uh, the next new video. So this last one is only for purchase only. So make sure you guys grab it because, you know, a lot of people who had never paid their membership end up buying it. So I don't want to put it out because it's not fair to uh, those guys. So if you want to see those last two, grab them, check the link, sent to, sent to you guys in an email for only $9.99. But the next uh, DVD will be on that page at the top. So make sure you guys check for that. But it's probably going to be a different, well, it's for sure going to be a different platform. It's going to look a lot different. So yeah, a lot of people who checked out the presidential debate, people asking my opinion on that whole thing. Of course, you guys already know, I don't get into that bull crap. All that stuff is just a blanket for people who still believe in politics and believe in these politicians. But yeah, of course, Trump saying, you know, black jobs and Hispanic jobs, it's a crazy thing. He should have worded that differently. But um, yeah, all that is just getting people to have conversations about what he said. Uh, the black people who have now jumped onto the Trump bandwagon or, you know, scratching their heads right now. But I mean, to keep it real, I understand exactly what he meant. And, you know, it's not a big deal just to keep people talking. But, you know, what exactly is black jobs? And anything that's saying black jobs has to be a derogatory way because it's like, if you say specifically black, that's what you mean. Or specifically Hispanic, that's what you mean. So please elaborate more on what is a black job or a Hispanic job, if you understand. You should have worded it differently, you know, but yeah, it is what it is just to keep the whole wheel going and people talking about the whole situation. But yeah, of course, we know how long, how old are you guys? 30s, 40s, same stuff every year, every four years. Politics, politics, politics. We're going to change this. We're going to do that. Nothing ever changes. The history of it is crazy that people are still following this crap. I can't believe it. So it's the perfect segue into our ancient history series rundown, which we're getting into in this video. And just me going in and out of the series and just put some things in there that people need to understand about this history. It's a lot. But yeah, I wanted to quick update. A lot of stuff happening, a lot of stuff going on. I'm putting on a lot of videos and keeping you guys updated as I go. So yeah, you'll see a big change to the site coming soon, uh, Merkel Black Academy. And again, make sure you guys take advantage of that uh, Merkel Black Academy uh, membership. Never pay again. It's going to be gone by Monday for sure, as well as the uh, catalog. So make sure you guys grab it. It's going to go back to $2,000 come Monday because that's what it's worth, to be honest, at least that. So, yeah, check out the video for you guys who haven't seen it, for you guys who have seen the whole Ancient History series. Rewatch it. A lot of information. Thanks for watching. Let's get into the videos. You think about the Genesis story. You get the creation of the heavens and earth and, you know, planets or what have you. But what is missing? And what's missing is the war, you know, the fall of Satan. What exactly happened? Why is that story missing from Genesis? It should be there. It's the reason why we found it in Ezekiel and Isaiah. And it's, you know, so far from the Genesis story. This is supposed to have happened before Adam and Eve, but it should be there. But this also, this also tells you that there is a gap. There's a time gap. There's a lot of time missing. If God created the heavens and the earth and, you know, all of a sudden we get man, we get Adam and Eve, there is some time missing. You know, what's going on? Then all of a sudden, you know, Satan shows up in the garden. That's a lot of time missing. And it's a reason why, you know, they put it that way. So when you get to Ezekiel and you start reading about uh, the story in Ezekiel 28, uh, you start reading from 1 to 13, we'll go to. Well, as a matter of fact, we'll go from 11 to 13, keep it kind of short. But when you start reading in uh, Ezekiel 13, 1, 
is talking about, you know, he's talking to Tyre, to the king of uh, Tyre. As a matter of fact, he's talking to the prince. That's another thing you got to understand translations uh, and a lot of the versions. In some translation, it translates into prince and in most of them. But in some, it translates into king, you know, or what have you. So, you know, just be mindful of that. It don't matter in the case, but just understand that he could possibly be talking to the king in the beginning and the king, you know, when they're speaking to, um, to Satan. So you'll understand in a second. But it starts out with uh, Ezekiel basically speaking to the prince of Tyre or Tyrus. Understand Tyre is Tyrus. Same thing. Get into that. And he's talking to him and basically telling him that God is condemning him for basically, uh, you know, claiming to be a God. So he's basically condemning the prince of Tyre or Tyrus for claiming to be a God. And then as you go on, you realize that, you know, he's starting to talk to the king of Tyrus. And basically what he's, what he's explaining to the king, you know, fits the story of Satan. This is one of the things you got to understand when you start getting into the story of Satan. It's confusing. It's confusing. And you'll see in a second. So we read here Ezekiel uh, 28, 11 through 13. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, son of man, take up lamentations upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, thus say the Lord God, thou seedeth up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Think about that. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, which tabrets are these things right here, and of thy pipes were prepared in thee, in the day that thou was created. So it starts out with him speaking to the king of Tyrus. So clearly, and what he's saying cannot pertain to him, but it's talking to him. But we know for damn well, this man wasn't in the garden of Eden. We know that this human man can't have, you know, these jewels built into his being. So we understand this verse is to be talking about Satan. A lot of scholars are in disagreement on the verses and what it actually means. Some people think that, you know, it's, you know, him trying to basically compare what the king of Tyrus is doing to what Satan did. That doesn't fit. A lot of scholars believe that the king of Tyrus was possessed by Satan, which makes a lot more sense. But when you read it, they seem to be coupling Satan with this man. Think about that. Why are they making a comparison? Why is it coupling Satan with this man? It's not being definitive and saying, What's exactly going on? Is this dude possessed by Satan? Are you talking about Satan? Which clearly he has to be. Who else was in the garden? Nobody else but Adam, Eve, the serpent, God. Definitely wasn't this dude. So what's going on? But we see this coupling of this story of Satan with the man. We see it again in Isaiah. So we read Isaiah 14, 12 through 16 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which did weaken the nation. For thou have said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Did you pick up on that? It said, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that basically brought down the kingdoms? Is this the man? See, a lot of people want to think about Satan. We hear him referred to as, you know, the serpent, the dragon, the beast, you know, Lord of the things that fly, Lord of the air, what have you. A lot of people don't conceive man because when you say the word man, you think of man mortal mortal man. So how could this man be Satan? How could Satan be a man? Satan's supposed to be an angel, Lucifer, the light bringer, what have you. So when you look at the verse, it's clearly saying, is this the man? So when scholars look at this, they say, well, we can't be talking about, you know, Satan, Satan's not man. I mean, it's clearly saying the man here. 
that word is not a misinterpretation in the uh, the ancient manuscripts. It says man. So what is it talking about? Again, coupling Lucifer, Satan, with man. What's going on? Why is it making this comparison? And you would have to stop and think if Satan is not a man, if he is to bring down the nations, the only way he can do it is if he get man to do it. Remember, in the 1880s, they took out about 15 books from the Bible. And in those 15 books, you had Maccabees, uh, one and two. And you can find them in the uh, Catholic Bible. But in the King James Version, we went for a long time without having Maccabees and uh, 14 other books uh, of the Bible. So when you start to realize that in Maccabees, it's getting into Alexander and um, the Ptolemies. So when you start to understand the history, when you start to read Daniel, you can look in Daniel and see that in Daniel, it's talking about the Ptolemies, although in the King James Version, they don't really elaborate on names. You'll get Darius, you'll get uh, Alexander in Maccabees, but not in the King James Version itself. So the whole point is we really have to look at biblical history to see the reason why they kept the Ptolemies out and what all that is really talking about. Now, it's crazy because there's no way you can be an historian. Or a researcher and go back in that time and look at the fact that before Kemet fell, you don't see the Greeks, you know, um, really dressing like the Egyptians and all that stuff that we've seen that I showed you guys from the um, museum. You don't see all that stuff until after the conquest. So it's as if, you know, they was watching and waiting, you know, really being jealous and really waiting to go in there and to be like the Egyptians and have that knowledge. And it seems like, uh, you know, once they took it, they really embellished themselves within that information and uh, really got a lot out of it. But history wise, when you go into the Bible, again, there is no way you can have these stories about these ancient times and not mention Alexander. You will not see Alexander mentioned in the King James Version, which is the authorized version. This is the, this is the version that they gave us. This is important to understand about the King James Version, how you can't just be, you know, crazy with it and just just off look it. You have to really accept this version and why it was given given to us because there's a lot behind it. So when you realize that it does not speak of Alexander in the King James Version, it speaks of Darius. But we don't see nothing about the Ptolemies or Alexander in the King James Version. And as I mentioned before, you have to really know about the Ptolemies if you're talking about biblical history, because they play a huge role. So, as I said, they took out the Apocrypha or what they call the Deuterocanonical books, the Apocrypha, which is you know about 15 books that basically was in between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the King James Version until about, you know, the 1880s when they took it out. Just all of a sudden took out all of these books and they said that they wasn't really, um, you know, as as uh, close to the other books, meaning they wasn't as divinely inspired as the other books of the Bible. So they removed them. Now, what makes that suspect and why this is important is because you have Maccabees, which we're going to get into first Maccabees, which is where it's talking about Alexander. It's talking about the Ptolemies. It's talking about that time. Now, when you read Daniel, as I was talking about before, it's also talking about the Ptolemies and Alexander, but it does not mention their names, which is really suspect. It's, you know, what's going on. So you can see how, as I showed you in part one, we found the history. We went back and looked at the fact that the Bible's history, talking about what was going on with the Phoenicians, entire what was going on in those lands during that time and what really happened when Alexander came in there and destroyed that city. We see the actual proven history differs from what it's talking about in biblical history. They don't even mention Alexander, but we know that whole story has to do with him, but it's not in your Bible. But we can see that they clearly is talking about the same thing. And I showed you in part one how they mixed it up. How when we go back and find that the hidden meaning is actually telling you who would come into those lands and conquer it. So you see how they switch it up. It's the same thing. 
So what a lot of religious people do is they go in, they read the Bible, and the ones who do know history understand about the Ptolemies. So a lot of people pick up on the stories and say, you know what, this they're talking about the Ptolemies, even though they don't mention them by name. The issue with that is if you don't go and look at actual history, a lot of people are believing that the story the Bible is putting out is actually real history. When that's not the case, the case is if you do not look at actual history and what many historians have you know, agreed upon, then compare it to the Bible. You won't get the truth. And, and the more you understand about how much, you know, the Greeks uh, conquered and what they did, it's just it's an insult. And we don't realize it's an insult because we don't know history. We don't know what really took place and we don't really get it. So we just go with the flow and what we have been brainwashed to believe as far as biblical history. But when you understand it's how can you not put them in there? But in our Apocrypha and First Maccabees says clear as day. It's talking about Alexander. So it says here, this history begins when Alexander the Great, son of Philip of Macedonia, marched from Macedonia and attacked Darius, king of Persia and Medea. Alexander enlarged the Greek empire by defeating Darius and seizing his throne. He fought many battles, captured fortified cities and put the kings of the region to death. As he advanced to the ends of the earth, he plundered many nations. And when he had conquered the world, he became proud and arrogant by building up a strong army. He dominated whole nations and their rulers and forced everyone to pay him taxes. When Alexander had been emperor for 12 years, he fell ill and realized that he was about to die. He called together his generals, noblemen, who had been brought up with him since his early childhood. And he divided his empire, giving a part to each of them. After his death, the generals took control and each had himself crowned king of his own territory. The descendants of these kings ruled for many generations and brought a great deal of misery on the world. So this is how we understand how Ptolemy I Soter became king of Egypt, who Ptolemy I Soter was one of his generals. And you start to really understand what was going on around that time. So the reason why, you know, we mentioned Game of Thrones in this part is because when we go through this, you're going to understand where they got the whole entire concept from. I mean, when you start reading about this time and this history and what was going on between these generals, between these people who split up uh, these kingdoms and had different uh, different lands, you see Game of Thrones. I mean, everything that you see, if you watch Game of Thrones, you're really going to understand this. Everything that you see and what's taking place in Game of Thrones is here. The only thing that is missing is dragons, but not really, not really. Because when you start to understand that in uh, Daniel, it's talking about dragons, as I pointed out. But also in the Apocrypha, one, we have Maccabees where it's talking about Alexander getting into the Ptolemies. But also part of the Apocrypha, you have the whole story about Bell and the dragons. And in Bell and the dragons, it's talking about Daniel, which how fitting is talking about Daniel and in the book of Daniel is talking about the Ptolemies. So you do have dragons. And as, you, and as you get into the story, you're going to have female warriors and you're going to have, you know, the same terminology about king of the north, king of the south, the kingdoms, bending the knee. All of this terminology you hear, you read about when it's talking about ancient Greece and the Ptolemies and everything that happened in the wars of the Diadochi and what took place. It's nowhere around that. Game of Thrones is talking about the Ptolemaic Empire, the Diadochi War, and what was going on back then. Plain and simple. It's nowhere around that to me. The whole thing about Ptolemy being a bastard, same thing with Game of Thrones, all that kind of talk is in the stories when you start reading and getting into it. And as we get into it, you're going to see what I'm talking about and you can start to point out things. If you enter Game of Thrones, you'll understand exactly what it's saying. So now understand, we're going to get into the story. Now, when Alexander died, you know, of course, the best thing to do, even though he split up, he split up the whole territory, start splitting up the kingdoms. And the best thing to do 
is to try to really take his spot. Everybody knew that when Alexander died, the person who took his spot would be looked at as the true ruler. You've seen the first two volumes, of course, by now. You see how this is going. We basically taken it from where the Egyptians was, you know, conquered, and you had the empire taken over by the Greeks and everything that transpired after that. Because when you start looking at history, everything takes place after the fall of Kemet. We see the rise of the European powers, we see the Renaissance and everything like that, leading up to, you know, what we know today. But this is where they established this faulty history and it's biblical, the so-called biblical history that is false. So when you go back into antiquity and you can uh, start tracing from the time when the Egyptian empire fell, what the Greeks was doing and what these people they are talking about in the, uh, the Middle East, you know, in Egypt or what have you, what was going on with the so-called Jews. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans and everything that was happening with the wars of the Diodoki and everything like that. What took place? Because it's in this time that we can uncover the truth. It's in this time that we can see exactly what took place and how they was able to, you know, push in this history. And that's exactly what they did. You have the truth and you have this history that they made up. And what they did was, as I showed you guys, they basically piggybacked off of real Greek history. And been able to basically show what the Greeks was doing in the wars of the Greeks that, you know, there's actual proof of these wars and then basically put themselves in the Greek shoes, but as Jews. So all these so-called wars that the Jews was fighting is talking about in Genesis and everything like that, that supposedly the Jews was going out and conquering and fighting and everything. But when you go and look for that, you're going to see evidence of war but not of the Jews. So as I showed you guys, it's really the Greeks talking about themselves and their wars and their battles that they had, you know, along the way. This is what this is about. So when you get that aspect of it, it's still a lot of things that they have to explain and put in place. One of the major things will be, you know, first of all, how is it that you had Hellenization going on, the Greeks going around, and stealing all these beliefs and conquering everything. And basically, as I showed you with the wars of the Diodoki, how they divided up the land. So how we have this going on in Hellenization and, and process. But for some reason, these Jews are allowed to practice Judaism. What is that? So this is how you really start to pay attention and reveal what really took place. Because you have an ancient Kemet. We know when it took over, I showed you guys at the museum. Serapis. Zeus Amon. And all these so-called Greek guys that everything that they instill in, in uh, Egypt to try to get the Egyptians to believe. But when you get down to Israel, for some reason, they say, OK, you know what? We're going to take over, but we're going to let the Jews keep the religion and keep following it. What's up with that? And then we know later on they will follow it themselves. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense for all this to be going on. And then somehow, you know, everybody is just Jews. Christians, everybody following this doctrine of a people that's conquered by a stronger people, supposedly. So when you start looking at it from this point, you can see what took place. But when you start to really know the history and everything behind it, it starts to basically show you the truth. And uh, it makes a lot more sense. So now, as I said, you know, I talked about how they had to go out and make these people. They had to go out and make sure that they can create Jews. They had to create these Hebrews to explain this history, as I talked about in uh, uh, the books of the Bible, the Bible series. I talked about that in uh, Edited Exodus and, and Leviticus. So definitely you want to see those. But understand, you got to create these people. They had to explain a lot of this history because there is no proof. So if you're going to be trying to in, uh, interject these people into history, you got to explain certain things that don't make sense. Now, when you're a person that know. When you know about something and somebody comes and tries to talk about it. I mean, if you know everything about the situation, you can tell when they lie. You can tell. It's like when somebody say they saw the movie and they, you know, they can't really give you any parts of the movie. It's like you ain't see that movie. Like I can tell I seen it. I don't know what you're talking about. So they have to try to cover for every single part. Every single scholar that's poking holes in the story is always a comeback. You ever see those real bad liars? They always got something, an excuse. You know, they're always saying something to try to basically make up for 
their story sounding like bullshit. This is exactly what's happening with the uh, antiquities of the Jews and uh, their history. So it's a lot they have to explain and answer for. One of the things they got to explain. They have to tell us how, one, they was in Egypt in the 6th century BCE and how they disappeared. So first of all, one, you got to put yourself there and explain how are you there. And as I said, these people that are there that are there are actually Greeks. And when, we're going to get into that in a second. But when you understand, when you start going back in history, how, you know, how are you going to talk about one people and not the other? Especially if this one group is supposed to be as glorious and, and, and huge as the Jews when you read the Old Testament. So when you have pharaohs and you have documentation of the Egyptians speaking of the Greeks and showing the Greeks, but no Jews. It's telling you, I mean, everything is giving you those connections right there that they were the Jews. That's who they are placing themselves to be. So they have to explain, one, how, because this is their claim, that the Babylonians came in to Israel and basically took them into captivity into Babylon. Now, what they know is they understand and proof a show that there were Assyrians. The Assyrians was coming into Kemet, and it was always these little wars and skirmishes between the Egyptians and the Assyrians. And the Assyrians would basically take over part of lower Kemet. So this is them again trying to interject themselves during a, a period where there's war and stuff happened. Because then, you know, it's chaos and stuff get lost and you, can, you can't explain everything during a war because it's not going to be so much pieces. It's just going to be remnants of a war. But there's other stories to be told that's basically destroyed and covered up by war. They understand this. So they want to interject themselves into this period of time and say, well, you know, I guess during this time, the Babylonians came in and basically uh, took them. Just for some reason, they ain't want no Egyptians. They wanted to, for some reason, just take the, the Hebrews and take them all the way back to Babylon, these grown ass men and women, and just enslave them for whatever reason. So this is what they claim because they have to uh, basically answer for the fact that they're not there during this war. During this time when you had Sam Tech the first, who Herodotus talks about, no, he exists. This is Egyptian uh, Pharaoh. During this time when Sam Tech is basically fighting the Assyrians. We're the Jews. If y'all was there, where are, where, where are y'all? Greeks was there, but there's no mention of no Jews. And I understand this. So when you read here saying, now this is the uh, military campaign of Sam Tech. It says Sam Tech won Egypt's independence from the Assyrian empire and restored Egypt's prosperity during his 54 year reign. The Pharaoh proceeded to establish close relation with archaic Greece. Telling you right there, that connection, we know that was there. The hieroglyphics and everything I talk about with them showing the, the depictions of white men being there. So we know the Greeks was there. And also uh, encouraged many Greek settlers to establish colonies in Egypt and serve in the Egyptian army. In particular, he settled some Greeks at Taphnes. So now don't let the you know whole thing fool you about the Assyrians. I understand the Assyrians, when they talk about the Assyrian Empire, it, it's also, it also includes the Babylonians and uh, the Sumer and the Arcadians. You have the Egyptians successfully defeating the Assyrians, which we would assume would include Sumer, the Babylonians, and the Arcadians. Now, if they can defeat these people, why would they have a hard time or basically lose? and the conquest uh, from the Babylonians. Because see, they want you to believe that the Babylonians came in into ancient Kemet, defeated the Egyptians, the Babylonians alone. We know there's supposed to have been skirmishes and wars, you know, uh, civil wars in uh, Mesopotamia between the Babylonians and Assyrians. And the Babylonians are supposed to have won. And you got to understand that whole thing when you start seeing Babylonians, of course, somebody's talking about something biblical. Assyrians, they're talking about historical stuff. Because that's what, you know, the name that they use and they try to really differentiate between the two. But mostly when you see Babylon is dealing with something biblical, they always throw that in there to give that reference because the Bible's talking about, you know, Babylon, the Babylonians. So, you know, it's tough to believe that they was able to defeat them when the Egyptians had already beaten the uh, Assyrians in a larger uh, uh, army. So now, Nico II. 
uh, Egyptian pharaoh, son of Samtuk I, named after his father. He takes the throne in 610 BCE. This is supposed to be around the time when the Babylonians come in and basically take the Egyptians out of Syria and out of Israel. So now it says here, Nico undertook a number of construction projects across his kingdom in his reign. According to the Greek historian Herodotus, Nico II sent out an expedition of Phoenicians, as I talked about before in uh, part two, uh, part one uh, of ancient history. I told you guys, the Phoenicians was there in Kemet. Plain and simple. They, was, they basically was the Egyptians. The Phoenicians, as I said, the purple people, name given by the Greeks, they were Egyptians. And this other people who was basically there in uh, Phoenicia to basically run that territory because it's basically trade grounds. But it's telling you right here that he took the Phoenicians. These are Egyptians. It's just the name they use, the Greeks use. But they were down there and they were, you know, um, in Tyre. And we know Israel's along the way. They rule Israel as well. As well. This whole stretch of lands I talked about, ruled by ancient Egyptians. This is during the ancient Egyptian um, empire. They had control of this land. So, you're saying, Nico II set out an expedition of Phoenicians, which in three years sailed from the Red Sea around Africa to the mouth of the Nile. Now, this is the important part down here. They said Nico played a significant role in the histories of the Neo Assyrian Empire, the Neo Babylonian Empire, and the Kingdom of Judah. Because, of course, they're going to throw that bull crap in there. This is bullshit. I'm going to tell you why. Nico II is most likely the pharaoh mentioned in several books of the Bible. They can say that with no proof. Where's the proof of that? So, where is his name? They don't want to mention no more names because they already messed up with Ramses. That was a monumental mistake. Put Ramses' name in there. Knowing it's not going to add up. But it's real easy for them to just come out and say, well, he's the pharaoh probably mentioned in the Bible to try to fit them in there. That's what it's about. Giving you enough to make it seem like they're telling the truth and that this stuff fits when it's all bogus. They could say anything. Where's the proof to back it up? He had nothing to do with this kingdom. But what they do is, since they understand it was turmoil around this time, it's not so much you can do to find proof. They interject people in these places. And this is one of the things that's weird when they try to interject Jews in servitude of the Egyptians, as if they work side by side. So to give us Jehoiakim, it says here, Jehoiakim was appointed by King Nico II, King of Egypt, in 608 BC. After Nico's return from the Battle of Iran, three months after he had killed King Josiah at Megiddo. Now Jehoiakim was supposedly King of Judah. King of Judah. Judea, however you want to pronounce it. He was the king there. So it's highly unlikely that the Egyptians, you know, Nico II brought him in to basically rule while he was out at war. Why aren't y'all fighting alongside each other? You know, what is he doing there? So again, this is they, they have to interject these people in to try to make it fit, to make it seem like, you know, the Egyptians uh, and the Greeks was just mingling in there together. But there's no proof of that. Plain and simple. They have to explain how they are in Israel during this time that the Egyptians are in power. And they're trying to make it like, well, they was in servitude to the Egyptians, basically working side by side. The Egyptians was appointing them to do stuff. But it's already giving you that hint when I was just explaining to you how you had, since they know you had uh, Sam Tech and you had uh, Nico basically getting the Greeks to work with them. That's documented. That's something we can prove from Herodotus and the Egyptians themselves that, that says and attests to the fact the Greeks and Egyptians was, li was living alongside. Where is any mention of the Jews? So they had to put this in there. Well, it was the Egyptians, it was the Greeks and the Jews, but it's no mention of the Jews. But they got to explain for that. They have to explain that. They have to explain why and how they are there and in what capacity are they supposedly in Kemet during this time. There's no mention of them except for, you know, bullshit like this. So now we're talking about the 6th century BCE. We know what's about to happen. We know eventually the Persians are going to come in there and take over Kemet from the Egyptians, right? So the whole question you have to ask yourself is, you have all these stories of the Jews in the Bible going out, fighting these wars, conquering the whole nine. I just read to you how Nico II supposedly put a Jew in charge 
of basically running this area while he was out at war, giving you the hint that you had not only the Greeks working with the Egyptians, but the Jews as well in some, some capacity. So you would think there's a lot of them there. So the whole thing is we know that the Persians came over. Now, according to the Jews, supposedly on their way to, to Kemet, to conquer Kemet, they stopped in Babylon, liberated the Jews. So they liberated the Jews, freed them, you know, beat the Babylonians, came over to Israel, beat the Babylonians there. Now, maybe if it did really happen, which we know it didn't, maybe, you know, you can say that the um, the Persians told some of the Jews that, hey, we're going to to Israel whatever they called it back then, and go ahead and take that land from the Babylonians as well. Y'all should meet us up there or what have you, but we don't know what the case was. But somehow, you know, they made it up there. 